We're at the Great Salt Lake. Now they tell me on a clear day, if you look in that direction, you would find Salt Lake City. If you look to the east, Ogden, Utah. And if you look to the west, Reno, Nevada. Now this track is part of the transcontinental railway that connected the east to the west. It's now run by the Union Pacific. In the old days, they used to go around the lake. It was long and it was dangerous. So they decided to build a cutoff. Most of it is a causeway built up with gravel and stone. But where the water got deep, they built a wooden trestle out of Douglas fir and redwood from the west coast. And we're here today to look at that timber. Boy, look what happens when salt comes in contact with metal. Morning. Morning. Ready to go? Yep. Here's one of the barges with all the equipment that they're using to remove these timbers, particularly the pilings. Up here on top of the barge, there are a couple pieces of equipment, a crane with a pile extractor and a loader to move the pilings around. Here's a few that they removed the other day, and look at these things, 18 to maybe 24 inches in diameter, 100 feet long, and they're covered with all kinds of minerals and salt. And down here is where they went into the mud at the lake bottom. Now, these don't look very promising, but we know that once you cut through these timbers, this beautiful material. They said we could watch today as they pull one of these out. Once the pilings are brought ashore, they're cut into links, and eventually they'll reach this station where they're power washed down, and this workman is looking for bits of metal before it heads off to the saw. This carbide tip circular saw turns the log into a square timber. Other parts of the trestle are filled with rods and bolts and nails. And at this station is where they get removed. This ingenious machine was developed by one of the workmen. Now the device hanging from the chain looks a bit like a claw from a hammer. It just grabs onto the metal and pulls it out quite easily. I'd hate to try to do that with a cat's paw. The way that this trestle was built is that first they drove those Douglas fir pilings into the lake bottom. Then they built a Douglas fir framework on top of that. Then a deck, which was tarred and graveled, more ballast added, railroad ties, and then the track. Now look at what they selected for the deck. Three by 12 redwood. And if you look at the end of this piece, you can see how close the growth rings are to one another, which means this was an old, slow-growing timber and it's still in as good a condition today as it was 65 years ago. When you clean it up, it looks like this. You can still smell and taste the salt. It's great timber, and it's a piece of history. I think we should find a couple New Yankee Workshop projects to build with this. Hmm, I can taste the salt. The good folks out at Salt Lake City sent me several timbers to work with. Now, it took me a while to cut through them, surface plane them, and joint them. And I ended up with a variety of different sizes because I had to cut around the defects. But this is what I have. You can still see where the steel went through the pieces because it stains the redwood. I've got some wide pieces, some 2x4s, some 2x6s, 
and a lot of one by three. From this wood, I ended up with our chaise lounge. It has a full reclined position. The backrest comes up into four inclined positions. And it has these redwood wheels that make it easy to move it around. The redwood makes it fairly light. And I also know that the redwood will hold up well outdoors. The first thing I want to do is trim the rails to length. But before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. I've laid out the rails for a series of mortises which receive tenons on the ends of the slats that go across the sheds. I'm just using my router, which is set up with a guide fence and a half inch straight cutting bit. I simply plunge the router in at the beginning of the layout and remove it at the end. Next, I have to make two mortises in the bottom of the rail, one on each end to receive the legs. I've reset the fence and I've made a plunge cut from each face, half the depth. Now I'll just complete it by going the rest of the way. Let's take a look at our prototype. There are a couple cross pieces that connect the rails. They'll add strength to the frame. They sit in mortises. There's one here near the backrest, and there's another one near the handles. To make those mortises, I've made a plywood template with a cutout, and I've clamped it right over the area of the mortise. To mortise it, I'm using the router now set up with a collar in the same half-inch bit. The collar rides around the template. The bit does the work. That hole is for a carriage bolt, which allows the backrest to pivot. I want to drill it now at the drill press rather than later freehand because I want it to be perfectly square and straight. Here, I'm beginning to shape the handle. No sharp corners, so here I'm rounding the end at the head. the top edges of each rail, I'm using a portion of a one inch radius router bit in my router table. Here I'm beginning to form the legs. First I make a 30 degree cut where it's going to meet the rail and then I'm going to form a tenon. Shoulder cuts are next. I've set the saw so that it's a half inch above the table. I've adjusted the fence for a one and a half inch long tenon. And I'm using my miter gauge set at 30 degrees. I make a cut on one face. To make the shoulder cut on the opposite face, I have to turn the miter gauge so that it's 30 degrees on the other side of zero. My tenoning jig holds the piece securely as I make the cheek cuts for each tenon. That completes the cuts for the tenon on the legs. Each leg is slightly tapered, so I'm using my homemade tapering jig to make the cut. I've cut it a bit strong. I'll smooth this at my jointer. That's one of two cuts needed to complete the front legs. 
Now I'll swing the miter box to zero and make the final cut. That's the cut that completes the bottom of the leg that gets the wheel. Let's look at the prototype again, and you can see that there's a piece that connects the two legs that have the wheels. That piece is let in, and it'll keep the legs from twisting. To make the notch, I'm just going to use my miter gauge and guide the piece through the table saw, nibbling away the material. That'll be the hole for the bolt that will become the axle for the wheel. Here I'm knocking the corners off of the tenons on the leg because the tenons have to fit into round mortises in the rail. Next in order is to route the bottom edges of the rail and all the edges of each leg. The time to do that is now because once the slats are installed, we won't be able to fit the router in there. Now I'm ready to start working on the slats. There are short ones on the backrest, longer ones on the bed. All the tenons are the same. So I've set up, as always, to make the shoulder cuts first. I have a similar problem with the tenons on the slats as I did with the legs. The square tenon can't fit into the rounded mortise. So I need to knock the corners off, and I've set up a quick way to do that at the table saw. I have a straight edge clamped down, and it just reveals a tiny bit of the saw blade. The fence is set away the same distance as the shoulder cut, so if I just slide the piece in, it'll knock off the corners. And that gives me a tenon that will easily fit in the mortise. Quarter inch radius round over bit in the router table does a quick job of easing the edges on the slats. The last milling step before we can do some assembly is to make a notch in this cross piece and just trim the corner so it'll fit into the mortise. As usual, I'll just nibble away the material at the table saw. Well, the trick here is to get all the pieces glued together and clamped before the glue dries out. So I'm going to have to move along fairly quickly. For the slats, I'm just using a weatherproof one-part carpenter's glue. As I'm putting this together, I'm thinking this old redwood timber supported steam trains 50 or 60 years ago. We've transformed it into smaller pieces of wood to build a chaise lounge, which will support sunbathers. If only the wood could speak. Now this is the socket for the cross piece, and I'm going to switch to a much stronger glue. This is a polyurethane glue. I put on a thin coat onto one side of the joint. It actually likes to cure in the presence of moisture, so on the end, of the cross piece, I'm simply going to wet it. Okay. And the trick here is that these slats are so close together that it takes a little patience to get them engaged, and then you can start to set them. All right, success. Now a couple clamps. Once again, I'm turning to my polyurethane glue to hold these legs in place, glue in the socket, and wet the tenon.
Now we'll clamp this in place because that polyurethane glue actually expands quite a bit as it cures. Okay, that should do it. We'll let this set overnight, and tomorrow we'll easily finish this project. I wonder where room service is with that lemonade. Well, good morning. I thought I'd get started today making the wheels for our chaise lounge. I have a nice thick piece of redwood that I milled out of that salvage material. I want the wheel to be wide so that I have a lot of bearing surface on the ground. I'm going to rough it out, leaving the line. To true the wheel up, I'm going to use my sanding center. I start by taking this locator and just tap it into the center of the blank. Now that locator rides in this slot and I've set this stop for a six inch diameter. I bring the wheel towards the stop, into the sandpaper, and then spin it around, giving me a perfect circle. A half inch radius round over bit takes care of the edges. The axle for the wheel will be a threaded bolt. And I'm afraid that bolt will wear away the redwood. So I've drilled a hole large enough to install a piece of heavy duty electrical PVC conduit. And that'll act like a bushing. To secure the piece of conduit in the wheel, I mixed up some two-part quick-setting epoxy. And I'll just set it in place and wait till it dries. The sides of the backrest are some one-inch wide pieces of redwood. I've mortised them for the slats, just as I did earlier. And I've drilled a hole for the pivot point. Once again, I'm using some of my weatherproof glue to join the tenons and the mortises. The adjustment arms for the backrest pivot on these little blocks. They're located centered on the side pieces and they're attached with some glue and a few more of those bronze screws. Now let's get back to the wheels. After the epoxy set up, I ground off the excess with my sander. The axle is going to be this half inch carriage bolt. Then I'm going to have a 5 8 inch washer, which slips over that first, through the wheel. On the other side, a half inch washer and a half inch nut, which I'll just bring on far enough to let the wheel spin freely. It's a spacer to keep it away from the leg. That goes right about there. And I slide that assembly through the hole we pre-drilled in the leg. Another half inch washer and then a half inch locking nut, which has a nylon ring which will keep it from backing off. This is one of the three pieces that makes up the backrest support assembly. I've just nibbled away a notch which receives this cross piece. Once it's assembled, it holds up the backrest. Once again, we'll secure these pieces together with some bronze screws. To attach the adjustment arm assembly to the backrest, I'm using a 3 8 inch carriage bolt, 
goes through the little block. A washer as a spacer. We align the two holes to go through. Another washer and a 3 8 inch locking nut. The backrest gets attached to the base of the lounge with a little bit longer carriage bolt. Another washer as a spacer. And it goes all the way through with one more washer and another locking nut. The last pieces to make for our chaise lounge are these two pieces which I've screwed together to make the adjustment for the backrest positions. I'll take them apart after I cut them out. Here's a poster board layout of the notches that need to be made. I did this by trial and error on the prototype and basically there are five positions. One here which is slightly inclined. This notch out is for the block that's on the back of the backrest but it also acts as another inclined position. One here, one here, and fully reclined. I'll cut them out, sand them, and then install them. I want to make sure that I glue this piece and I've located several screws and put them at the most critical points where the stress will be the most. I don't want this piece to break. All right, that seems to work fine. A little bit of final sanding, all I got to do is find a cushion. Let's try this out for size. I picked it up at my local patio and garden furniture shop. Ah, it feels pretty good, nice and comfortable. You know what I like the most about this project? Is remembering where the wood came from. That was quite a story. Well, last time we removed one of the oldest pieces of furniture here in the workshop, the miter bench. It served us well for 12 years, but it was time for some improvements. So we've come up with a new version. Last time, I showed you how to build the base cabinets out of this 3 quarter inch birch plywood. We built a countertop frame out of half-lapped 2 by 4s and covered that with 3 quarter inch plywood and this quarter inch hardboard, and then trimmed out the edge with some poplar. We also made the draw boxes, and I showed you how to dovetail this joint at the front corner to give it plenty of strength so it can't pull apart. Today I want to install the hardware and the draw fronts. We're already putting this side of the unit to work. Production pocket cutter, smaller draws for some knives and jigs, and over here a home for the drum sander. And I like these trays because it makes it easy to remove the tools and put them away. Let's start today by talking about the draw hardware. This is full extension, heavy duty hardware, rated for 100 pounds. Why full extension? Well, we don't want to have to reach under this overhang to get into the draw. 